Great, wonderful. Thanks so much for inviting me to this event. It's, uh, it would be even more terrific to be there in person, but uh, it's very nice to be at this meeting. Great, so indeed I'll tell you about Euclidean wormholes, baby universes, and unitarity and quantum gravity. So now let me start by reminding you what the uh, uh, basic issue we want to understand is. So going back for 50 years, we know that black holes have in their dynamics some interesting analogy with the laws of thermodynamics. So as Bardeen, Carter, Hawking, and Bekenstein already showed in 1973, black holes satisfy uh, rules of mechanics where, for example, the mass, the change in the mass of a black hole is the surface area times the change in the area. Um, the area of a black hole is uh, non-decreasing in any classical process, and the surface gravity, this kappa, is constant on the horizon. And clearly, these are informal analogy to the laws of thermodynamics. Now, furthermore, in 1975, uh, Hawking further showed that black holes actually radiate like thermal bodies. You imagine a pair production process just outside the horizon right there, and one element of the pair falls in, one falls out, and you can show that this outgoing radiation acts as if it's thermal with a temperature of kappa, which is the surface gravity. So black holes act like black bodies. And uh, what's weird is, of course, strange, is that the black holes arise as solutions to the vacuum equations of motion. So you could very well ask, how the heck can this possibly be? Now, we're ve well used to the idea in physics that if you want a unitary description of thermodynamics, you basically need to uncover the underlying statistical physics. So really the question then for about 50 years has been in what senses is empty curved space, because that's what black holes are, uh, uh, the universal description, effective description of about e to the entropy, e to the s complex microstates. So a version of that question um, is, or, uh, is, um, is how is unitarity preserved by quantum gravity? Namely, um, one way of asking that question is you imagine stuff falls into the black hole, you know, and elephants, encyclopedias, whatever, and it Hawking radiates away like this. And then we uh, ask ourselves, can we decode what fell into the black hole from the Hawking radiation? So that's the problem of uh, the black hole information puzzle and of unitarity in quantum gravity. Now there's a certain sense in which it's obvious that in fact, the physics has to be unitary, right? So one argument is, of course, the ads -CFT correspondence in that setting, or if it is the case that quantum gravity is dual to a um, standard conformal field theory, there's no room in the standard conformal field theory for loss of information or lack of unitarity. So, uh, well, you know, somehow it must be preserved. But there's an even simpler argument of the following kind. So let's just assume that the black hole entropy arises from some underlying space of discrete microstates. So grant me that, that you can explain the entropy in some statistical sense. Then, um, well, you know, uh, if quantum mechanics is valid, then, you know, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is generically non-degenerate in quantum mechanics up to symmetries. So it must be the case that each black hole microstate has some unique energy or mass up to symmetries. Now, of course, in gravity, mass is a notion or quantity that's measured at infinity through a sort of Gauss law type of measurement. There's no local notion of mass. So it must further be the case that precise mass measurements will tell you the energy and therefore will tell you the microstate. So this very simple argument tells you that asymptotic observers must be able to measure the black hole microstate. But the trick is, how carefully do they have to make the measurement? So how precise does the mass have to be? Well, you know, you're, uh, if the entropy of the black hole is S, S as a function of energy of the mass of the black hole, but the degeneracy of the black hole is so, so that you have the degeneracy times, you know, whatever your precision in the energy measurement is, delta E, must go like E to the entropy. So I don't know what the pre uh, precision of the measurement of apparatus should be. Let's suppose it's a multiple of the Planck mass, then this kind of huge um, density of states, the, if you have e to the s states between e and e plus delta e, the level spacing must go like e to the minus s. In other words, the super Planckian resolution in the, in the, uh, uh, in the spacing of states. So uh, what does it take to measure um, um, mass or energy with such precision in order to resolve the black hole microstates? 
Well, we also know from quantum mechanics that there is an energy time uncertainty relation. Delta E, delta T is bigger than or equal to H bar. So if you wish to measure energies with such precision, then using this uncertainty relation, the amount of time you require goes like E to the plus entropy, E to the S. Now entropy goes like area of the black hole divided by four G, G Newton times H bar. So this means that if you fix the area of the black hole, and you fix the Newton constant, and you send H bar to zero, taking the semi-classical limit, which is where we're usually thinking, then the time scale that you need to resolve the microstates precisely goes to infinity. So this very simple argument says that, well, clearly, in some sense, all the information about the state that's present at infinity, you can read it out by reading off the mass, but the semi-classical observer simply can't access it. So as you take the semi-classical limit, H bar to zero, you know, um, uh, you lose information. And in this sense, the causal disconnection of the black hole interior is kind of an artifact of replacing the time scale e to the one over h bar by infinity. So the bottom, so you can generalize this argument in, instead of using, you know, if you like, in effect, one point functions, measurements of the mass, you can take endpoint functions, you can do this, that, and the other. And the bottom line is that this kind of argument suggests that all the information about black holes is available at infinity. So the thing is clearly unitary, but the semi-classical effective field theory probes that we are going, that we are used to, are going to give kind of universal measurements and you're not going to be able to tell the state spot. So that's the essential problem. So to summarize, the information is available. So in some sense, we know that the thing is unitary, but it's hard to measure. And uh, 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 I left out the whole, you know, further complication of dynamics. You know, there's the phenomena of scrambling and chaos and thermalization, and all of this mixes the information about, the infinite, about incoming states, uh, which makes it just uh, even more difficult to access using simple observables. So in this sense, the story seems to be the black holes are like standard complex systems, right? They lose information through coarse graining. They just have a ridiculously dense uh, density of states that is non-perturbative with Newton coupling, and that's why they sort of feel unfamiliar and strange. In this presentation, this language, it would appear that to see the unitarity of a black hole, you somehow need to know the underlying microstates. You need to have access to them, you need to be able to separate them, and so on. And the semi-classical effective field theory description is not enough in this kind of picture, you would have thought, to be able to see the underlying unitarity. So there's another perspective we can also take, or a further perspective, that we can add to this language, which is the information theoretic perspective on uh, unitarity in quantum gravity. And that goes like this. Remember, we talked about already the um, uh, Hawking radiation as being involving pair production just outside the horizon, let's say, where one quantum goes in and one quantum goes out. So Don Page observed that if you think about Hawking radiation this way, you should think about the outgoing Hawking quanta being entangled with the interior of the black hole. So in this language, the radiation, the Hawking radiation looks thermal when the interior of the black hole is integrated out. And so that's why it's thermodynamic entropy keeps increasing because, well, you know, it's entangled with something, you've traced that thing out. So of course the, the entropy keeps increasing. But we also know that there are general rules about quantum entanglement. And in, particularly, in particular, there's the monogamy property, which implies that qubits can't be, one qubit can't be entangled with you know, two different qubits at the same time, uh, or maximally entangled. And so as a result, monogamy of entanglement implies that after half the radiation has emerged, the entanglement entropy must start decreasing again, like so here because the number of interior bits that you can be entangled with is decreasing. So this is similar to the reasoning that led Mathur, Samir Mathur, and the AMPS, uh, uh, authors of the AMPS paper to argue for macroscopic corrections to black hole physics after half the radiation has emerged. So from this perspective, from this sort of information theoretic perspective, a test of unitarity, or well, a partial test of unitarity, is recovering the page curve, somehow demonstrating that the entanglement entropy of Hawking radiation will increase and then decrease, or actually if the black hole comes into equilibrium with the radiation, so if it doesn't radiate completely away, that the uh, entanglement entropy increases and then flattens out. So in the last year, there have been two really lovely and very interesting new developments. So it seems that it may be possible to see the unitarity of black hole evaporation, at least in the entanglement entropy in the page curve directly in semi-classical gravity, but that in some situations, gravitating theories may actually be dual to ensembles of theories and not a single unitary theory. So I personally view these two sort of new developments as being intention 
with each other, and we'll discuss that more in a few minutes. And both of these developments arise from a similar thing. It's from a recognition of a novel role for space-time wormholes in quantum gravity. So I'm going to try to take the time today to sort of discuss these developments from the perspective, from the lens of uh, some papers that uh, uh, we have written. So these are, uh, I'm basically summarizing work done with Arjun Kar, Onkar Parikar, Gabor Sharoshi, Tomnovi Ugajin in this paper here. Uh, another paper that should hopefully come out by early next week with Arjun and Tomonori. And then a third paper with Arjun and Simon Ross and Tomonori Ugajin that came out a little while ago. So I'm gonna to try to discuss this perspective of recovering unitarity using just in semi-classical gravity. And then, uh, and then the sort of um, apparently contrary seeming finding that uh, uh, if you include the uh, Euclidean wormholes necessary to recover uh, uh, unitarity, then the effective description of gravity is somehow in an ensemble. So we'll discuss the potential tension between these statements in a little bit. Any questions so far? By the way, feel free to uh, interrupt me. And if I feel like I'm running out of time, I'll just uh, postpone the question to later. Okay, so let's begin. So uh, let's see. Uh, by the way, can you still see my cursor? Uh, yes, we can. Great, so let's start. So uh, the, uh, the new ideas concerning recovering the uh, unitarity of the page curve um, in semi-classical gravity are associated with a thing called the, Hoc, uh, the island formula. And how does this go? So as we said a moment ago, if you just um, naively in effective field theory evaluated the entropy of Hawking radiation, it increases without bound, as Hawking said. But um, uh, monogamy of information says that if you have an evaporating black hole, the entropy should go up and then go down for the radiation. And if you have, if the radiation comes to equilibrium with the black hole, it should increase and then flatten off. Now, a variety of authors listed here have suggested that a solution to sort of recovering the unitary page curve in semi-classical gravity goes as follows. So you imagine that you have a box that contains the radiation, and then you imagine that in the gravitating region of the universe, you have a island, quote unquote. Then you construct, uh, then the assertion is that the entanglement entropy of the radiation, SA, on the left-hand side of this equation, is actually given by the following formula. You take the box that contains radiation, that's A, and then you uh, take the union of that box with some island B in the gravitating region. You take the, um, uh, you find the effective field theory entropy, the standard field theory entropy on the union of A and B, that's this quantity over here. And then you add to it the area of the boundary of the region B, right? So you, this is like a Hawking type formula, except there's no necessarily, not necessarily horizon there, an area over 4G Newton. And then you minimize over all possible choices of B, of this island B. And um, the suggestion, which you can show, works in various cases, in the case of JT gravity, to, uh, especially in the case of JT gravity in two dimensions, it's been shown that this formula will recover for you a unitary page curve, and uh, you basically show, uh, in these cases, uh, in the, in the, in the two-dimensional cases, uh, you get evidence from the replica trick that this kind of formula ought to be true. So I'd like to start today by sort of investigating the generality of this formula by trying to extend it to three-dimensional gravity. Now, three-dimensional gravity is interesting for multiple reasons. First of all, it's a little less trivial than two-dimensional gravity, uh, but it has black holes, right? There's, uh, although there's no local graviton in three dimensions, there is the BTZ black hole, and it's got many interesting structures like multi-boundary wormholes and so on. So there's a, it's a good playground in which to investigate the system. Um, However, because there is no local graviton, we don't have to deal with dynamics. And so solutions, all solutions that we're gonna be interested in can be constructed through global identifications of three-dimensional anti-disitter space. So this basically means that although you can solve the equations completely explicitly, you can also reason everything out in pictures. And so today, basically I'm gonna reason everything out in pictures because it's kind of easier for a talk, but every calculation can be done explicitly. So let me remind you what the Penrose diagram of the BTZ black hole looks like. So, you know, here's the future singularity, the past singularity. This is the uh, one asymptotic infinity. Here's the other asymptotic infinity. And here are the two horizons uh, that run between. 
So this is the setting we're going to start in. And here I've drawn a red line, which is a trajectory, a dynamical trajectory of a brain going through this uh, space. And we will be interested in thinking about that. So our goal is going to be in the first part of the talk to derive or justify the island formula in three dimensions as opposed to two dimensions using uh, conventional holographic ideas. So basically, I'd like to do this in a way that's a sort of a... a uh, I'm going to try to argue that it's a natural consequence of conventional holographic ideas that the island formula must be true. And then I will also try to tell you that there is a replica trick version of the argument that also shows you that the island formula must be true in three dimensions. Okay, so how do we go? So the setup is going to be as follows. So we're going to take, first of all, here is the, here is the BTZ black hole. This uh, dotted line here is an equal time section, right? And R here is going to be where the radiation is going to sit. It's the radiation reservoir. We're going to collect all the radiation from this black hole in a little reservoir over here. So here we go. So here's the equal time, time reflection slice of the BTZ black hole. And there are two asymptotic regions, A and B. Okay. So the first step we're going to proceed with is to truncate the second asymptotic region by a brain whose state models the microstate. So this may seem like a kooky thing to do, but it isn't uh, necessarily uh, for multiple reasons. You know, we know many, many examples in string theory where the microstates of, the, uh, of black holes in string theory are indeed described by various kinds of d brain states behind the horizon. So this is supposed to be a toy model of these kind of d brain states sitting behind the horizon of a black hole and modeling its microstate. So we're basically using the kind of technique that Kurkulu and Maldesena used in their EOW brain microstate model. So on this end of the w, uh, world brain, we have you know, various states labeled psi i. These are supposed to be like the black hole microstates. Now, so this is our setting. And we also imagine that you know, this is anti de space. So the black hole comes into equilibrium with its radiation. So I collect the radiation and stick a little reservoir here. And so the reservoir is sitting just outside. Uh, the reservoir has, let's say, weak gravity in it. And we're going to collect it there. And now we're going to suppose that the microstates of this black hole are maximally entangled with the k Hawking quanta, as they're supposed to be. And so we can write the joint state <clears throat> of black hole microstates and radiation in this way as IR psi A, you know, it's some sort of maximally entangled uh, uh, state within the subspace of uh, some sort of fixed energies. Okay. So now what I want to do is in the end, I want to compute the entanglement entropy of the radiation and sort of find a way of doing that. And we were going to try to use holographic techniques to do that. So to do this, we're going to play a trick. So now I'm going to suppose that this end of the world brain itself is holographic. Let's suppose the theory of this end of the world brain is itself a conformal field theory. Again, there's plenty of precedent for this, as in if you look at many of the D brain systems that build up the actual microstates of you know, black holes and string theory, their low energy theory is described by conformal field theory. So you can think about this as a model of that. So we're going to assume that this end of the world brain itself carries a conformal field theory on it. If so, I'm going to allow that end of the world brain, that's this dashed red line, to be itself described by its holographic dual. So we can draw that like this. This was the equal time section of the original black hole. Now here is the end of the world brain. Now the end of the world brain I now have to think of as living on the boundary of its holographic dual. So, so I'm gonna draw its holographic dual inside here, this disk here, is the holographic dual of this uh, original, uh, of, the, of this end of the world brain. So that's in here. And now, since I know that the states of this end of the world brain were entangled with the radiation, and I've traced out the radiation, right? I'm not looking at the radiation, I'm just looking at this system on the end of the world brain. This itself must look as though it's thermal, and therefore its dual must have a black hole inside there. Okay, so, so let, me, let me say a couple of those things again. Uh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me with questions. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I'm not actually looking at the chat box, so somebody's going to have to tell me if uh, questions are appearing. Anyway, okay. So, so once again, so here was the equal time section of the BTZ. The radiation is here. Here's the end of the world brain. Now, if I take the dual of the end of the world brain, it can have its own central charge, length scale, Newton constant, different from the original space. You know, it's whatever the dual of this brain is. If we trace out the Hawking quanta, because the state of the end of the world brain is mixed, its holographic dual will contain a black hole. Okay, so that's the setting. And our evaporation protocol is we systematically increase the number of quanta, of radiation quanta over here, um, uh, with which 
the, uh, the end of the world where it is entangled. So if you like, the entropy of the black hole within this, what we'll call the inception disk, within the, which is the holographic dual of the end of the world brain, the entropy of that inception black hole is log of K, where K is the entropy of this radiation. So that's the complicated part of the setup. And now you'll see using a bunch of pictures, we can easily reason out what's going to happen. Hi, hi, so, okay. can I ask you a question, uh, Gautam here? Hi, hi, Gautam, how are you? Very good, very good. So, nice to see you. Uh, nice to see you too. And uh, could I go back to the previous slide? Once this more? one? Yeah. Right, so, the, um, so as in the Kurkulu Maldasena uh, paper, uh, your, so the uh, uh, various states of the end of the world brain uh, are going to model the microstates of the yeah. black hole or? In this case, yes. Okay. Yes. But later we'll see another example where we're not in any way trying to model the microstates. Uh, where they and rather the uh, we're going to consider you know effective field theory states on one side and so on but right now <laughs> these are modeling the microstates okay, okay. in in again in kutlu malasena they they accessed i mean the gravity accessed only a little bit of the end of the world particle uh, you know like the tension and the mass and so on and so forth so here yeah. the, the so the gravity gravity in in, in the btz uh, black hole how much how much of the properties of the micro uh, states of the end of the world brain can the gravity in the btc black hole access it's similar to that other setting you mentioned so the only things that the gravity on the gra uh, on the btc side the only thing that matters is <clears throat> is the um uh, are things like the tension and indeed uh, 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 and the total number of states, you know, things like this. That's because when we try to, uh, did I ever, oh yeah, I'm going to describe how we write down the solution. Um, uh, when you write down the solution, what do you need to know? You need to know something about the tension of the brain, so its trajectory. You need to know something about, um, uh, um, you know, what the stress tensor on the brain is and things like that. So it's very coarse properties that you actually want. I'm describing this in terms of some number of microstates because we're imagining uh, you know, it's entangled with the radiation and then there's some entropy log K and so on. So we don't need much at all about the properties of the state. I actually think it'd be better if we could include the properties of the state. So a very nice thing would be, we know various examples like in the D1, D5 system where we know what the D brains are supposed to be that are making up the microstates of the black hole. So I think an ideal situation would be to do this for real in string, in string theory where you have those microstates and you carry out a thinking in this manner, right? So. So we can come back to that further. I mean, there are other examples too. So if you look in ADS-5, if you look at the you know, half BPS, quarter BPS, and eighth BPS black holes, so I have some old paper with uh, Jan Dubur and, uh, and uh, Vishnu Jajala and Joan Simon, basically right. arguing that if you go near the singularity, you'll find that these things look like intersecting brains of different kinds, right? And, and, you, can, and you, you, know, you can evaluate their properties and so on. So ideally, one would want to do it with that system. So this is the toy model of that. Did I answer your question? Yes, thanks a lot, Vijay. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, all right, so the next step is going to be, so we have this black hole, right, which is supposed to be the dual of the end of the world brain. So now what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to purify this black hole. So how do you purify the black hole? You introduce some auxiliary system with which you say that the, this end of the world brain is entangled. So here's the auxiliary system. And so I imagine here's the original BTZ, here's the end of the world brain, the, end, the dual of the end of the world brain was a BTZ black hole. The BTZ black hole is purified by having this other asymptotic region, okay? So, so, and so then, so here's the other asymptotic region. And then, so in this picture on the right, we've sort of unfolded this so that you can sort of see the two sides. Now, actually, of course, the, uh, the end of the world brain was originally purified by its entanglement with the Hawking radiation. So in some sense, this auxiliary system is the radiation. So in some sense, this sort of inception part of the geometry actually lives on top of the original geometry and it's folding on top. And really this other asymptotic boundary, this inception boundary is really the radiation boundary. So in some sense, this is a realization of the ER or you know, some sort of pictorial realization of the ER equals EPR type philosophy. Okay, so in other words, uh, suppose you have the radiation from the black hole and you kind of remove it from the space and keep it in a reservoir. If you do that, you sort of split the bulk dual. 
into the original BTZ and the dual to the radiation, and we've removed ER equals EPR bridges with radiation, put them on this side. You, if you want, you can think in that language. So, but I'm just going to persist to say that here's the end of the world brain. You know, it had a, its dual was some sort of black, inception black hole because it was in the formal state and effect. Um, that has been purified by putting this other asymptotic region. And if I choose to take some sort of equal time section from this, it looks like a long wormhole. Here is the one, the original boundary. Here is the horizon. Here was where the end of the world brain was. Here is its dual. And here is the boundary that's supposed to be modeling the radiation. So there's a long wormhole between two horizons, one on the inception side, that's the blue lines. And then there's the original uh, uh, horizon of the BTZ, which is this black line. OK. So technically, what do you do? Well, so let's take the Euclidean version of this. So you know that the Euclidean black hole geometry is the, is the cigar. What's been done is you slice out a piece of that cigar. In, so this angular direction is Euclidean time. So this here, this, about this edge here is where the end of the world brain trajectory would be. You solve for the equations of motion at the end of the world brain and it sort of goes like this. And what's been done is, well, so there's that cut there. So on the other side of the cut, you've put in another uh, black hole type geometry, so another cigar. So it's like a folded cigar geometry, right? So if you'd like to visualize this, you can take this inner part of this uh, folded cigar and sort of pop it out. So you draw the whole boundary. So this part and this part, you draw it as a circle. And then looking from, from the top, from, from the open side here, the trajectory of the brain at the end of the world brain looks like this kind of red line. So you can picture it like that. So, you know, to solve the problem, to construct this geometry, you need a solution to the equation of motion. We basically impose some modified version of the Israel junction conditions. You require that there's a BTMC metric on both sides. The metric better be continuous. The induced metric on the end of the world brain better be continuous on the two sides. And because this, um, this inner part here is supposed to be the holographic description of the end of the world brain, we require that the, uh, you know, basically the boundary stress tensor of this uh, inception part of this geometry should be entirely holographic. Right? So the induced stress tensor on this brain is what is the holographic stress tensor of this, uh, of this inception geometry. So that you, know, you have a solution to the whole thing. Okay. Are you so assuming now, that the, the brain is tensionless? Um, no. So there's a solution we and write down. Wouldn't, wouldn't you have a jump in the extrinsic curvature if the brain had tensions? Well, that'll contribute then to the, uh, you can include, okay, so you can, uh, there are various scenarios you can construct here. You can make a tensionless brain, you can make a tension full brain, you can include the tension of the brain in the, um, uh, uh, you can allow the brain to have a non-holographic component to its stress tensor. So there are various scenarios that you can construct here. And uh, then you sort of modify the matching conditions as appropriate for those cases. See, but the case that you're studying would be like the simplest tensionless brain then? It would be the simplest example of that kind. But you can construct mm -hmm. different scenarios of that kind. Thanks. Okay, great. So now we're ready to study uh, the holographic entanglement entropy here. So I'm going to try to do this in the standard Ryu Takanagi language with which you're all familiar. And then we're going to discover that if you apply the RT prescription with this scenario, you will find that the island formula that we alluded to at the beginning will pop out. So that's supposed to be the idea. OK, so, so what's the standard prescription for computing entanglement entropy? Well, you know, suppose uh, this was this full geometry, where now I have this inception thing, which is supposed to be dual to the end of the world brain. And you tell me, uh, please compute the entanglement entropy of this region of the original boundary, A1. Then Ryu Takenagi tell me I found a minimal surface. That's this thing here, this orange line. But it could happen. And, and then compute its area over 4G Newton. But it could happen that this minimal surface, of course, hits the end of the world brain. If the end of the world brain had been there, now what I would have been led to do is to compute the entanglement entropy of this piece of the brain that's contained within the RT surface. But now we've done, taken the holographic dual of the end of the world brain. So really what will happen is that this, uh, we're proposing anyway, that what you should do is you should allow the surface to refract into the inception geometry. So it goes this way and then refracts in. And you should add to the entanglement entropy this piece. 
So this piece, the area of this piece within the inception geometry is the entanglement entropy of this, uh, the holographic version, RT, uh, Ryu Takanagi version of the entanglement entropy of this segment of the end of the world ring. Okay, so that's the idea. So in other words, the entanglement entropy of this region A1 is the minimum over the extremal surfaces of the area over 4G Newton of the piece that's in the original geometry plus this brain segment piece, which is the same thing as saying add this additional piece within the inception geometry. So now I can equally well compute instead of the entanglement entropy of the original space, I want to compute the entanglement entropy of the radiation. So, all right, so in fact, we want the entanglement entropy of the entire radiation, of all the radiation. So we take this entire inception boundary, and so we need to compute, according to Ryu and Takanagi, uh, surfaces, minimal surfaces that are homologous to R, and these are the candidate minimal surfaces that will tell you the entanglement entropy of R. Now, because this thing is the full boundary circle, there are two surfaces, minimal surfaces here, which are homologous to it. One is this horizon, on the inception side of the geometry. Remember, there's the holographic dual to the end of the world brain. In some sense, this entire left part of the space represents is a holographic description of the radiation. And then there is, of course, the original black hole horizon. So roughly speaking, and this, this entanglement horizon size, we said was log k, where k is the number of Hawking quanta. Right? So that's what it's going to be. So then, if you compute the entanglement entropy of R, it's going to be equal to the minimum of this inception horizon, that's log k, and the original black hole um, uh, entropy. So how does that go? Well, when, whoops, what just happened? Um, right, so early in the evaporation protocol, when there's not much radiation, so this uh, area of this horizon is small, you will find that the minimal surface that dominates the RT calculation, the Ryu Takanagi calculation is this one. And therefore the entanglement wedge of the radiation is this green region. And in effect, the radiation only knows about itself and doesn't know anything about the interior of the black hole. But then late in the evaporation protocol, the same rule, the RT rule will tell you that you should pick this as the minimal surface in, in question, because of course this inception horizon, the blue line is bigger than this original black hole horizon. So now the entanglement wedge of the radiation contains all of the radiation uh, inception geometry plus the interior of the black hole. So if I didn't draw this holographic dual to the, uh, to the radiation, what this would say is that uh, the entanglement entropy of the radiation involves the area of the boundary of a region in the original gravitating region over here. So the, now the island then is the interior of the black hole and its boundary is the original black hole horizon, just like in the original island formula. So uh, and this island, uh, if, you, if you sort of uh, uh, erase this inception picture and draw the radiation as being stuck over here, in effect, this island in the gravitating region is disconnected from the asymptotic part of the real space where the radiation was originally collected. So you see that uh, that's, that's basically what the island formula would say. So now, um, uh, okay, great. So that's an art, uh, Ryu Takanagi type uh, derivation. And you might say, well, you know, I'm a little bit uh, uncomfortable with this because, you know, did this kooky trick of the end of the world brain. And then you put the end of the world brain and you did this kind of holography with the end of the world brain. There's lots of moving parts here. I wish there was some other kind of derivation. Well, there is. So we can also prove this by the replica trick. So remember here was the Euclidean sort of folded cigar geometry that we said described this, uh, uh, this sort of uh, this full inception space. Now, suppose you want to compute the um, uh, entanglement entropy of the radiation. What do you do? Well, you know, the uh, if you want to use the replica trick, what you do is you compute trace of uh, the density matrix of the radiation to the nth power, and you know the usual thing. You take uh, and then you continue n to one, and you take some derivatives and so on. So the way you do that to compute the Renyi entropies, these trace of rho to the n. So here uh, is as follows: you cut open the Euclidean geometry over there, let's say, and then you replicate it multiple times um, and, um, and then sew it together. So here, for example, you're sewing together these little, um, um, uh, the geometry along the cuts. So I'm just, I'm, I'm looking here, the picture here is just taking the boundary and drawing the sewing together of that because it's complicated to draw uh, the full geometry as being replicated and stuck together. And so this is the boundary that's been replicated and stuck together in the usual Renyi way. And then you're supposed to fill in this uh, boundary uh, with a replica symmetric 
uh, saddle point of the bulk gravity theory, and then you evaluate the action. Right. So that's 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 the way in which you're supposed to uh, uh, carry out the replica trick here. So now the key is that there are actually two replica symmetric saddles. So the first one is what I drew earlier. So let me just, just uh, this, this picture may be confusing. So, oh, there it is. Uh, here it is again. So I drew this, uh, did I draw this earlier? Ah, uh, yes, so you see this, this thing. Okay, great, so th it's there here again. So there are two replica symmetric saddles. So if I have a boundary with these sort of cuts that I've attached together in the replicated boundary, there are two ways to fill this in in the bulk in a replica symmetric way. One is uh, this way, where I fill in the bulk geometry with a fixed point of the, Z, of, the, of the replica symmetry on the inception side, on the radiation side, if you like, of the system. And this is another replica symmetric saddle where you fill it in on the real black hole side. And so you have these two saddle points. And so um, while it will not be obvious from looking at these pictures, this replica symmetric saddle is like this follows. So imagine that you have, um, you know, uh, the radiation thing and you have the gravity thing. It's like here, what you've drawn is additional wormholes running between the original BTZ parts of the geometry is really what's going on. This will become more clear in another example that I do in a moment. So if you don't fully follow that picture, that's okay. Anyway, there are these two, the important point is that there are these two saddles and this is kind of wormholes running between the gravitating region is what this is about. So, okay, so you're supposed to compute the path integral on these replicated boundaries. You holographically fill the boundary geometry in um, in these two possible ways. And then these two kinds of saddles exchange dominance. And the exchange of the dominance is then related to the uh, RT picture that I was drawing earlier, where for at, uh, when you have less radiation, it's the inception horizon that dominates the entropy calculation. When you have lots of radiation, it's the black hole, original black hole horizon that dominates the black hole, uh, the, 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 the entropy calculation. And that's, that's the fundamental source of this transition between, uh, uh, between these two phases. Okay, so I'll, I want to do, uh, I'll try to explain this better in a simpler example in a minute. But before we do that, I, let me just describe some consequences. You know, we should, after having done the work, we should get some goodies out of this. So here's one goodie. So imagine that you split the radiation to two parts. So remember how we had the inception geometry to the left here, I've sort of drawn it back as if it's on the right. So I've taken the radiation and I've split it into two parts, the early part of the radiation, let's say, and the late part of the radiation. So in the language that I was using earlier, here's an equal time section, here's the BTZ, here's the, on the other side of the inception of the end of the world brain, I've kind of uh, split the inception, uh, the radiation into two asymptotic parts, the early and the late part of the radiation, let's say for example. Now, um, one of the virtues of working in three dimensions is that there are these multi-boundary wormhole solutions. So actually you can carry out you know, calculations like this explicitly. So if you like, earlier I was modeling the Hawking radiation as being one on sort of one asymptotic boundary. Now I'm modeling the Hawking radiation on two asymptotic boundaries, if you like here, as if the uh, roughly speaking to model the idea that the early and the late time radiation, if you like, can't really talk to each other. Okay, and so you can construct all of this completely explicitly and you can check our paper, for example, for details of how you go about doing these things, it's kind of fun. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask the question. So here are two parts of the radiation that purifies the end of the world brain, right? So can you reconstruct the black hole interior, all or part of it with just part of the radiation? Let's ask that question. Fine, so to ask that question, I'll take part of the radiation, There's, let's say this R1, this first part of the radiation, and uh, I'm going to use the Ryu Takenagi formula to figure out <clears throat> its entanglement wedge. So what surfaces, minimal surfaces in this full geometry are homologous to R1? Well, there's this little uh, horizon there. And then there's, turns out that there is this surface that uh, refracts through the position of the end of the world brain. And you can show that early on in the radiation protocol, so when the R1 doesn't, you know, small or there's less radiation, you'll find that this, uh, that this dashed blue line dominates. And at late times, this purple line dominates. So at late times in the radiation protocol, when, you're, when there's lots of radiation, so you can recover lots about the world, you will find that, um, that uh, the entanglement wedge of this radiation region contains a part of the interior but not all of it. That's perhaps not surprising, you don't have all the radiation. So now you could ask the question, suppose I give you the radiation R1, 
uh, uh, and they give you the radiation R2, but you don't have access to both at the same time. So you can decode whatever you want from this R1, and you can decode whatever you want from R2, but you can't you know, process them both at the same time. Well, then the entanglement wedge of R1 includes this region behind the horizon, and the entanglement wedge of R2 includes this region behind the horizon. But this purple shaded region here is neither in the entanglement wedge of R1 or R2. So this is a picture looking from, from this side at this, uh, at this purple blob. So there's this sort of purple region, which is not in the entanglement wedge of either R1 or R2. So what that tells you is that there's some sort of quantum secret sharing scheme going on in the radiation. That is to say, if I give you all of the radiation, but only in pieces, and you can't do quantum processing on the radiation together, then you can't decode the entire interior. So an observer needs access to all of the radiation to recover the full interior. So this goes back to the, <clears throat> to the point I was making at the beginning, that if you did, uh, for example, semi-classical measurements where you just sort of measured simple things like the mass of the black hole, of course, in the end, you can recover things, but it's sort of very hard to do. So in this case, for example, if you separate the radiation into two parts, um, you need access to all of it at the same time in, in order to recover the full interior. And this is like a quantum secret sharing scheme. So the outcome in the end, uh, what is the outcome here for unitarity in semi-classical gravity? So the first thing I would say is we're suggesting that these arguments say that the entanglement island phenomenon extends to 3D gravity. We've tried to justify this directly by just using the RT formula uh, extended to allow extremal surfaces to pass into this kind of inception geometry that purifies the black hole microstates. Uh, you can recover the page transition, recovering, uh, preserving uh, semi-classical unitarity, and that there's some kind of quantum secret sharing scheme whereby you need simultaneous quantum access to all of the radiation to recover the black hole interior, you know, uh, having par uh, access to part of it and then to another part of it and just classical communication between will not do. So that's the first, uh, that, so that's the first unit. Now, the pictures I was drawing of the replica trick, uh, 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 well, they were confusing even to me, so I'm sure they were confusing to everybody else. So it's useful to have more simplified settings in which we can understand why this island formula is occurring. So this, so that's what I would like to try to sort of talk a bit about. And this is going to be discussed in more detail in a paper that I'm writing with Arjun Kar and Tomonori Ugajin, which will hopefully appear uh, early next week. So, the, so the, in, the, the original entanglement island formula was derived in two dimensions by applying the replica method. And I described various ways of trying to attack that in three dimensions, including a sort of replica technique, but it's a bit confusing to read. So, in all of these cases, uh, there are many technical challenges, right? So one technical challenge is that there's a gravitating region that's directly glued on to a non-gravitating region. So you have to solve the welding problem to sort of completely understand how this thing works together at the sort of various confusing points. And that of course also makes it difficult to extend the argument to higher dimensions, because you know, if I give you a four-dimensional geometry, which is gravitating, stuck to a four-dimensional geometry, which is not gravitating, it's not even clear how you make that all self-consistent and so on. So, the, so if all of this is true, that semi-classical gravity somehow knows about you know, the unitarity associated with the microstates, you should be able to do this even in, a, in an even cleaner setting, which consists of disjoint universes. So we're gonna consider two disjoint universes. They could be open, closed, um, you know, non-compact, compact, whatever. I'm drawing here two balls, but you know, it could be any of those things. And I consider two <clears throat> universes, A and B, will put conformal field theories on both A and B with gravity only on B, right? And so our goal is going to be to think about how you compute the entanglement entropy of universe, um, let's say A or B for that matter, right? when these things are in some complicated but entangled pure state. I mean, this could be us, right? You know, we have a universe, but all I know there's some other universe floating around and we're entangled with it. So what would happen, right? So <clears throat> how do we uh, work things out? So there's a total Hilbert space, which is A times B. And in A, there's just a, uh, a field theory, a conformal field theory. And so the effective action is log of the partition function of the conformal field theory. And in B, I've got some gravity theory and I have a conformal field theory. So we're gonna work with two dimensions because in two dimensions, you can do all the calculations and we're gonna take JT gravity. It's just cleaner than the settings discussed before because nothing is, is they're just entangled. No, uh, A doesn't communicate with B classically in any way. So what should you do to compute the entanglement entropy of the non-gravitating universe, right? This would have been the radiation in the pictures that we were discussing earlier. 
So, well, so let's start by making an entangled state. So suppose I make a state <clears throat> that looks thermally entangled. So I have I are the states of A, psi I are the states of B, and let's suppose it's the same conformal field in A, in A and B, so we can sort of associate the states. And let's consider a thermal field double-like state on them. So we take weighting factors PI is e to the minus beta EI over Z, where EI are the energies of the states in universe B. And now I'm going to also agree that universe B contains gravity. So in addition to the CFT, uh, here is the standard action for JT gravity. And here we could take positive cosmological constant, negative cosmological constant, whatever we want. So the rules are, I'm supposed to compute the entanglement entropy of universe A. So I, tr I can construct the outer product in a psi psi, um, of the density matrix, and I trace out B. So that's row A. Now I want to compute the entanglement entropy of A with this gravitating universe B. So I need to compute trace row A log row A, and that in the standard replica kind of way is the limit as n goes to one of the derivative of, uh, of, uh, of the Renyi entropy. Okay, so great. So the next step is then I have to compute the Renyi entropy, right? So all completely pedestrian here. So what, how do I write down the Renyi entropy? Well, you know, you take row to the n. So I write down row to the n here, and this is the trace, and that's why the psi i1 is equal to psi i1. I've got many of these thermal factors here. So let's look at this expression. How do we calculate this? Well, so um, um, uh, for the moment, I'm going to talk about these two universes as spheres because it's easiest for me to talk that way. They don't have to be. You can construct other kinds of universes. But suppose they're spheres. Then um, the overlaps that we're talking about in this computation are basically constructed by preparing states in the equator. So what you do is you take each, uh, you know, copy, n copies of the sphere because that's, uh, if you take row A to the end, you know, you've got to splice n copies of the sphere together. And what you do is, uh, is uh, so the replicated manifold contains n copies of the gravitating universe. And each of those copies, you place, you know, let's say the operator creating psi i in the North Pole and the operator creating psi j at the South Pole, and you do the path integral. And you keep repeating this, and you have to do it for each of these and then do the sum, and that's the prescription, right? It's completely explicit. You're doing CFD on some background. You can do these calculations, et cetera. Okay. So it turns out that if you try to do this calculation, normally in the conventional path integral approach to compute entanglement entropy, this is what you would do. For the second Renyi entropy, you would replicate the pair of universes, AB, AB twice, and you would run, and since you're computing the entanglement entropy of universe A, you'd put a cut there and you would tie these two things in together. You would do the path integral of this manifold. Remember, gravity is only there on B. So you're just doing the CFT path integral on A, and you get what you get. And that's the answer for the entanglement entropy. Effectively, the new proposal um, by these authors and others, effectively, the new proposal says that you should also consider um, these saddle points with this topology. So in addition to constructing you know, the obvious um, uh, uh, you know, worm, uh, if you like wormholes between A and B, you know, because you've got to splice these things together for the Renyi calculation, you should also, because you're doing a gravitational path integral on B, you should also include uh, 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 wormholes between the gravitational replicas. So this is one kind of saddle point and one kind of saddle point. So the steps are as follows. You fix the topology and geometry, the replica geometry, here are two choices, and you go ahead and then compute CFT correlators, if you like, in this setup, and this setup and to do essentially do the sum. So this is uh, uh, this involves some conformal. Uh, we're, 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 even though it's in two dimensions, so you can do everything explicitly. It takes some fancy conformal field theoryology, and so we're borrowing techniques from oops from a very nice paper by Sharoshi and Ugajin, who worked out how to do this when you want to compute endpoint functions on these kinds of replicated manifolds and so on. So okay, so you have to do that. And the step three is remember. Um, uh, uh, the action for B actually contains you know, gravity here. And so if you trace out A, there's going to be a stress tensor on B from the density matrix after you trace out A. And so you have to use the back reaction of that, um, of that stress tensor to compute the full on-shell action of JT gravity. Basically, you need to do the, uh, basically you need to do the path integral, put everything on the saddle point. So for universe B that involves the gravitational saddle point also compute its action and add it all up. So Turns out. Um, sorry, Vijay, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Yeah. So I am a bit confused. I thought that, that you were doing a partial trace over B, not over A. So well, I mean, what do you mean by tracing out uh, A? Mm. So I, yeah. I shouldn't have said tracing out. Um, okay. So so when you try to do this calculation, mm. right, you're doing some path integral calculation in B. 
right? So, so, so you take trace row A to the N. When you right. take trace row A to the N, you have to compute the sum over overlaps, right? The sum of overlaps, oh, sorry, the, yeah, the sum of overlaps involves a path integral on B, psi I other states on B. That's because, you know, row A was in fact some trace over B. Right. But if you're going to do that, then you're doing this path integral. Yes. So when you do this path integral, the question is, you know, what do you get? And if you do that, so we're, we're doing that part of the path integral. So you need to work out, you know, these sets of overlaps and then uh, compute the action for the gravity set. And so if when, you, when, when you want to compute the equation of motion for this, you have to ask, what is the stress tensor for mm. the gravity part of this? And the stress tensor that you get on the right-hand side of the equation of motion is going to be associated to whatever, you know, whatever you get. After, uh, you're not looking at A. But if you trace out A, that's the stress tensor that you would get here. I see. So the, the exchange of dominance happens only on the B side for you, right? Is that uh, right? So uh, on the A side, you always have this cut, mm. yeah, you know, because you're, you're computing the Renyi by putting the cut on A and then connecting them. So that, that's always there. The question is, do the wormholes on B, you know, these are two possible saddle points for the path integral on B. On A, you're obliged by the Renyi thing to have the to have this cut. Okay, got it. Uh, but on B, you have a choice of which saddle point you're going to get, right? I mean, we wouldn't have done this, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, right? I mean, we would have said, well, you have no business adding this uh, a second saddle point on the right, right? But now, suppose we agree that Euclidean quantum gravity always told us we have to sum over topologies, right? So uh, that's a hypothesis we should follow now. Okay, so, so let's I mean, do that. There is nothing extraordinary about this, right? I mean, the the fact that all topologies should be included, I mean, it's not it's not it's it's not new, uh, you know. It's not new. Yeah, absolutely. So so I think this is an idea that people in quantum gravity have been saying for decades. Right, right. right. Uh, uh, so uh, so so what's happening? I think in the last few months is a more detailed exploration of the consequences of that idea, including. Maybe when you're doing the replica trick, you should take that seriously. If you're doing a path integral in Euclidean gravity, you better include the topologies, someone topologies, right? Why didn't we do that, right? So that's, that's uh, and, 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 and you know, to some degree, you know, you're, we're searching out the rules. Who knows? Maybe for the replica trick, you shouldn't use it for some special reason. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but then you have to ask, but in retrospect, you have to ask then why you shouldn't use it in the replica trick because you're just doing here, as presented, a path integral, right? And the path integral in Euclidean gravity usually involves a sum of topologies. So you, you should include this. Okay, so, so you do that. And then there's some exchange of dominance. And uh, um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's one more thing I want to say, so I'm not going to go through the calculation in detail. So basically what happens is at low temperatures, you get the standard uh, you know, thermal entropy of A or B, but then at high temperatures, uh, you, uh, at high entanglement, by temperature here, I mean the sort of entanglement temperature, you know, quantifies the strength of the entanglement. At high entanglement temperatures, what basically happens is that um, uh, you, uh, there's an exchange of dominance and the wormholes between the, gra the, the saddle point that contains wormholes between the gravitating replicas uh, uh, matters and you get an island-like formula. Uh, you, well, you get the island formula. You discover that you should include an island in the universe B. So you can use this now because you've got two separate universes that entangle each other to study the appearance of islands in a cosmological setting. And that's uh, basically what we're going to do in this paper with Arjun and uh, Tomonori that will appear, I hope, uh, uh, next week, famous last words. Okay, so uh, I hope this setting was kind of clearer than the three-dimensional setting. It's sort of much easier to draw you know, two-dimensional replicas. And, but really, this is all that's going on. Uh, take seriously the Euclidean quantum gravity prescription that you should sum over topologies. Okay, so all of this sounds great, right? You know, somehow, you know, somehow magically the uh, Euclidean path of gravity knows about unitarity, knows about the microstates, even though there's no explicit representation of microstates, etc. But at least in my view, uh, there's some recent work by various authors, and I'm going to describe the version in, in our own work, but, you know, it comes from other authors uh, that suggests that including such wormholes uh, actually does something funny to unitarity. So let me remind you that this island formula gave a unitary page curve by including space-time wormholes between gravitating replicas. So now in general, in the Euclidean path integral, uh, if we include space-time wormholes, holes, what does that look like? So imagine here that this is, you know, this is the uh, time is running up and this is, so this is the universe evolving up in time. 
So now if I allow space-time wormholes, I'm really allowing handles of this kind. So if I do that and I take slices at different times, so then if I take at this early time, you know, there's one connected component of the universe, but then if I take a slice this later time, there are two connected components. There's this original component and then there's a disconnected baby universe. So roughly speaking, the Euclidean path integral, a sum on space-time wormholes is equivalent to a sum on baby universes, right? Which again, as Gautam said, you know, people have been saying for, you know, decades that you're supposed to do, right? Just hard to do in general, right? And so there have been various, uh, very interesting uh, pieces of work recently. Rasad Shankar Stanford comes to mind, and especially Marolf Maxfield, uh, his recent paper, which, we're, which we are going to follow rather closely, right? Um, and so these papers have suggested that if you include such baby universes or space-time wormholes, then actually the dual isn't unitary despite the fact that we somehow managed to derive unitary page curve using space-time wormholes, that the dual isn't unitary, but rather requires an ensemble of theories. So I'm going to kind of test how this works by taking the a very simple topological model of Maroff and Maxfield and sort of generalizing things to include spin structure. As you will see, that making things more complicated by including spin structure actually makes it completely obvious that you can't describe that system uh, uh, using just a single unitary theory. So how does this go? So I'm going to get, this is going to be relatively rapid since I think I'm towards the end of my, uh, I have like five minutes or something. So I'm going to sort of just give you a snapshot of this. Okay. So we're going to think about two dimensional, this is following Maroff and Maxfield. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to consider two dimensional topological gravity with spin structure. So how does this work? So um, we are going to consider a, the two dimensional gravitational path integral. Um, uh, 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 and uh, following the prescription quantum gravity, we're supposed to sum over all possible topologies with a fixed boundary condition. So we're gonna pick a boundary condition. So here's a, a one boundary, a second boundary, and third boundary. And I'm going to imagine that I do the path integral uh, um, uh, over all, uh, uh, I sum over all two-dimensional orientable manifolds with n boundaries. And then some of the boundaries can have periodic boundary conditions for fermions, NS boundaries, or they can have anti-periodic boundary conditions for fermions. So that's part of the definition uh, for the gravitational path integral, which of these boundaries has periodic or anti-periodic boundary conditions for fermions. So uh, following Maroff and Maxfield in this topological model, a genus G geometry, a geometry is basically weighted by uh, e to the Euler character times some constant, plus n times the number of boundaries, right? So, so this is the, uh, so we're gonna sum over all possible topologies. And what's more, if many spin structures, which is also a topological thing, are allowed for you know, a, a geometry with a certain number of boundaries and a certain uh, number of handles and so on, then I have to sum over all the spin structures too. So this is a definition of a topological gravitational path integral. So, and you'll get whatever you get for the partition sum. Okay, so the, the question that we want to go after again, following Maroff and Maxfield, is whether or not this path integral, which is a lot like the ADS-CFT path integral, you know, you have some bulk gravity, you sum over it with some boundary conditions, whether this has any hope of being described with a single unitary theory. So let me, uh, just because we talked about baby universes, let's you know, talk about this as a baby universe kind of interpretation. So although I've drawn all of these boundaries at late times, if I slice open this path integral, let's say there, then, and sort of think about time running this way, then you can think about this as saying that if you have a certain number of NS and Ramon boundaries on one side, the path integral with that boundary condition defines some state. And then the full path integral then gives the inner product between you know, the bra and the cat, uh, depending upon how many boundaries of each kind, NS and Ramon, that are on either side of the cut. So we can define sort of Hermitian operators on the baby universe Hilbert space that creates NS and Ramon boundaries. I imagine that there is a, uh, uh, the, uh, that, yeah, so there's a baby universe Hilbert space, and these are sort of boundary creation operators. On it. So I'm, I'm using all the standard language of Euclidean quantum gravity. So in this language, then the path integrals that we're interested in computing essentially compute the following correlation functions on the baby universe Hilbert space. You take the hartle hawken boundary, uh, uh, hartle hawken state, which is the no boundary vacuum, and then you stick into it, you know, uh, 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 the creation and annihilation of a certain number of uh, remote NS boundaries, and we're computing this correlation function in topological quantum gravity in two dimensions. Okay, so the, 
you can calculate this. Uh, the virtue of this exceedingly simple model is everything is completely explicit. So there's uh, you know, all kinds of relations. You know, Stanford and Witten told us that if you sum over all spin manifolds, uh, 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 spin structures for two ma manifolds with n boundaries, nr of which are remote, then there's a formula that tells you how many spin structures there are. Merrill from Maxfield you know, went ahead and you know, found out how many manifolds there are. You know, they basically added up how many manifolds with a given number of boundaries and a given ball and uh, there are, and so on. And so if you work this out, this correlation function that I just talked about, these kinds of baby universe correlation functions, have the, um, uh, uh, give the following formula. Um, so if I have N, NS, N, NS, NS boundaries, and N, NR, NR, Ramon boundaries, um, you get this formula uh, for the full answer for these correlation functions. So, um, uh, we're going to talk about this in a bit more detail in just a moment. But so it's a complicated formula, obviously. But here, notice that this is a sum on some number d. And here, there's a sum on this some number m. And there's some interesting appearance of the number of NS boundaries and the number of Ramon boundaries. Right? So in a standard holographic duality, this, this result of the bulk path integral should basically compute a product of partition sums in the dual theory. So what would you do? Well, for the NS boundaries, you'd be computing the partition sum. And for the Ramon boundaries, you'd be computing the Witten index because you know, you've got uh, periodic boundary conditions for the fermions. So you know, by, uh, by, how to say, uh, uh, morally speaking, if you, uh, if you generalize from ADS CFD, you would expect that you know, basically there'd be some set of boundary dual theories sitting on these NS and Ramon boundaries. You compute their partition sums and Witten indices and you multiply the whole lot. And that should give you this. That's, that's how holographic duality is supposed to work. But it's completely obvious that this cannot work in that way. Why is this? If you have an odd number of remote boundaries, so if NR is an odd number here, this thing vanishes. Whereas for an even number, it doesn't. So if you just look at the sum from, because, of the, you know, uh, because the way the sum works, you'll see that there's equally many positive and negative contributions. So if NR is an odd number, this is going to vanish, it turns out. So what that tells you is there is simply no way by adding Ramon boundaries that you can say that the, if you add one more Ramon boundaries, you just basically multiply by one more factor of the, of the Witten index in a boundary. So there's just no way of writing this as a, as a product of partition sums on the boundary. So you can't really think about this in that way. So how could you think about this? So it turns out that you can think about this as follows. So this, once again, was the correlation function, partition sum we were calculating. So PD here is sort of a Poisson thing. So suppose you considered n copies of a theory with a d-dimensional Hilbert space and a vanishing Hamiltonian on the circle, right? So that's going to be our duals, right? So the Hamiltonian for the dual theory should vanish because the bulk is a, you know, a topological theory, so the Hamiltonian is zero. So anyway, so the, we're just going to sum over the Hilbert space with you know, every state has the same energy at zero. So we're going to assume, we're going to, let's imagine n copies, so for the n boundaries, one on each boundary of a d-dimensional Hilbert space. And then let ns of the theories have ns boundary conditions and nr have Ramon boundary conditions. And let's just agree that if I fix d and ns and nr, that you know, the path integral for these topological field theories and these boundaries indeed computes the product of partition sums and Witten indices. Now, if you look at this, what this result from the gravitational path integral looks like is that this first sum looks like a sum, is an, uh, as an, uh, like an ensemble average with Poisson distribution on the dimension of the Hilbert space of these dual theories. That's what this first sum looks like. And then the second sum looks like you're summing over um, what fraction of the states in the Hilbert space are fermionic versus bosonic. So I uh, with some binomial probabilities. So thus, because of this, the topological model of gravity I described earlier has an interpretation the ensemble of field theories where you sum over all possible dimensions of the Hilbert space of the theory. And for each dimension, you consider you know, an ensemble of theories with different numbers of fermionic and bosonic states. And you sum this all up with various weights and you would get the same thing as the gravitational path integral. So this is the kind of thing that also happens in Saad Schenker Stanford, as well as in Maral for Maxfield. And this is why these authors, and I guess we here, are suggesting that at least these kinds of models of gravity, which include space-time wormholes or baby universes, require an interpretation in a ensemble of theories as opposed to a single unitary theory. 
Now, the reason why I'm raising this point at the end, you know, even though it's very quick at the end of this talk, is the whole point of this uh, seminar and of much of the recent work is the question of is black hole, is quantum gravity unitary, right? And um, we argued that by using, uh, using uh, um, um, uh, the island formula, which is derived from adding you know, space-time wormholes, or baby universes, summing over you know, Euclidean wormholes when you do the path integral for gravity, that you can get this island formula that restores the unitarity of Hawking radiation uh, in semi-classical gravity, at least in terms of the page curve, right? So that, of course, uh, there's one immediate question there, that somehow the Euclidean path integral with these wormholes kind of somehow knows about the microstates. That's very odd because you know, you're taking a single Euclidean saddle point and somehow it knows about the existence of the microstates uh, that in the Lorentzian section that you know, restore unitarity. So one question I have is how does the Euclidean path integral know this? Because you're talking about a single saddle point, um, Euclidean saddle point, and somehow it knows that there are these microstates that restore unitarity. But I do think that there's a tension between that statement and what I just said a moment ago. Because at least in some circumstances, it appears that space-time wormholes force an interpretation of dual ensemble. But if that's the case, the dual ensemble is not unitary, right? I mean, you have the statistical ensemble of the theories. So personally, I think that there is a real puzzle here that we need to sort out. On the one hand, including wormholes restores unitarity in the page curve. On the other hand, including wormholes forces an interpretation ensemble. So I think that's when we're going to have a lot of fun over the next year or so. Uh, sorting out the relationship between these two statements and also uh, trying to answer this question of how the Euclidean path integral actually knows about the microstates. I'm going to stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Vijay, for a, a very interesting seminar. Uh, we do have time for maybe a couple of questions because then we have to break for the discussion. Uh, so go ahead. Maybe I have asked my quota already, but if I'm permitted, then... Please, I... please, Gautam, go ahead, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is about, um, you know, so I'm puzzled by this thing also, that including uh, some of the topology somehow seems to destroy unitarity of quantum gravity. I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I, I, can, I can think of the following thing, that let us imagine uh, uh, computing uh, string field theory Feynman diagrams. Uh, you know, you have the pants diagrams and you have the one loop string field theory uh, diagrams and so on and so forth. Certainly, uh, by definition, these are sums of topologies. But we don't say that string field theory uh, is, uh, you know, sort of non-unitary in any sense. Maybe this is not the right analogy because one is probably talking, uh, you know, the 2D quantum gravity is that of the world uh, world sheet uh, uh, thing. So maybe you were saying that uh, from the point of view of a 2D quantum gravity, if I uh, think of the polyak of uh, path integral, then that, uh, and if I want to think of this as a single, single uh, theory, 2D theory, then I won't be able to do it. And it's necessarily a, um, a, an ensemble of theories, the various sum over uh, topology. Is there, is there, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, so perhaps that's what I'm saying. Uh, I'll confess that I'm not entirely sure what the meaning of these statements is. So, just I mean, just to be specific, uh, remember that the statement was. Well, uh, let's just first focus on what the technical statement is, and then try to poke holes in it. So, the technical statement was uh, in this context. There's mm -hmm. some topological path integral that you do that gives this answer. Then you would like to get this answer if you if you can using a dual description. Mm. that is single unitary theory. On the face of it, it seems complicated or difficult to do so, right? So what would you cook up to equal this? And really, what's being done is a kind of answer analysis to say that I could get this answer <laughs> if I took this prescription that I have a bunch of D-dimensional Hilbert spaces with various fractions of, you know, fermionic and bosonic states, and I do the path integral, and I would, you know, with some weighting factor, and I will get this. That's not a derivation. It's an, it's an answer analysis. And you could, you could readily ask, and, and we should, whether there are alternative interpretations that would make this unitary. As in, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe the dual shouldn't be thought about in this case as living actually on the literal boundary like we would in ADS-CFT. After all, this is an ADS-CFT. Uh, maybe there's some interpretation of this 
uh, as unitary theory, uh, not on this boundary, but in some other abstract space that's related to this. I don't know, right? So uh, basically, I'm trying to pose this more as a puzzle than as a statement. I, I take your point that usually when we sum over topologies, right, in string field theory or, you know, uh, various kinds of string diagrams, we don't conclude from that that the whole theory is somehow non-unitary. But no, notice in those cases, really the original, the theory we're actually trying to describe is in 10 or 11 dimensions. Mm -hmm. right? The 2D quantum gravity is just a, 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 a way of calculating. Let me also make another comment that I've been um, kind of, uh, it's, an, uh, uh, it's a connection that I find intriguing with these ensembles. So the, uh, these kinds of ensembles of theories describing space, personally, I saw happen once before. And let me tell you what that story was. So this is some paper I wrote with, uh, with uh, uh, Nico Yokela and uh, Esko Keskivakuri and uh, Jody Majumdar many years ago. Mm -hmm. So you consider a universe uh, uh, at which, uh, you know, which has a beginning in time. And at the beginning in time, you put one of Ashok Sen's you know, decaying brains. Mm -hmm. So there's a decaying brain at the beginning of time. This is an attempt. This was originally an attempt to try to get an ADS-CFD in time. right? So just like you have D brains and you come close to the D brain, you know, you have a dual the space, you know, let's suppose you put uh, uh, a, D and a decaying brain at the beginning of time, let it decay away and somehow try to derive from the physics of the brain, a dual uh, a cosmo to a cosmology. That, that was the idea. Okay. So you imagine you have this initial brain and it's decaying away following uh, one of uh, Ashok's uh, calculations, right? And then you can, of course, perturb that initial brain by putting operators on it. And those perturbations will cause, you know, uh, are the initial condition that produces the decaying radiation, that modifies the decaying radiation. You can show that the calculation for computing those correlation functions and the radiation and everything uh, takes a very sort of, um, sort of evocative form. It turns out you can write those calculations explicitly as a sum of correlation functions in, a, uh, in an ensemble of matrix models where the matrix models vary in their SUN matrix models, you know, there's N equals one, two, three, four, five, you know, so, and, and you can further show that the larger N bec the, uh, becomes, the later in time, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the later in time after the decay of the brain, uh, the physics you're describing. So as you, in other words, as you go far away from, the, uh, you know, as time evolves, larger and larger matrices in this ensemble become relevant. So that, that's all very evocative because, of course, large N SUN is somehow related to large spaces, you know, closed strings, blah, blah, blah. So that somehow feels good. Um, but there was an ensemble of matrix models, right? Mm -hmm. so, and I, at the time, you were like, what does this mean? Nice. Ensemble of matrix models, you know, uh, surely it should have been somehow unitary. Maybe this has to do with the fact that this is a Euclidean surface at the beginning of time. And how do you describe you know, a time evolving universe with a, on a Euclidean surface, in the end, you're going to need some statistical physics because there's no time on that Euclidean surface, right? So what else can you do? So, so uh, you know, uh, these were our confusions at the time. So I have been wondering if part of the reason these things are happening is intrinsically, you know, we're doing all these Euclidean calculations. Maybe we're really talking about, you know, somehow duals at the beginning and end of time, that kind of thing. And then what can you do? You're going to have to have uh, some statistical ensemble because there's no time in it. So maybe there's something like that going on. Uh, that's just a throwaway comment. I have nothing, uh, I've sort of puzzled over this now for weeks and I don't have anything more substantive to say. But I think it's an intriguing connection, so I mentioned it in passing. Thank you. Can I ask yeah. a question? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, carry on. Uh, okay, hi. Uh, so. Yeah, there is Prem. Yeah, hi, hi Prem. Hi. Uh, so I have a question, a related question. So kind of going back probably to um, your comments right at the beginning about, you know, not being able to resolve, observers not being able to resolve uh, the microstates. Um, uh, and, and also this relates to some of the stuff that uh, Saj Shankar and Stanford discussed um, when they were computing these things, products of partition functions, uh, spectral form factors. And, and the point is that these, these things, if you compute these quantities exactly in the field theory, they're supposed to e exhibit um, oscillations at late times. Yeah. Yeah. And these oscillations are very fast oscillations. Now, I guess the question is, uh, you know, when we are computing these things or asking these kinds of questions from the point of view of gravity, 
are we doing a kind of coarse graining over short time scales? When we, when we do semi-classical gravity, there's a kind of coarse graining implicit. Um, and it's that coarse graining which at the end of the day is uh, manifest itself in, in kind of non-factorizable. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be yeah. different theories, but it's just that the average you're talking about or this ensemble that you're talking about also achieves the same thing that the coarse graining over short time scales would achieve. Is that even I, possible? Yes, absolutely. I think this is a very, very reasonable comment. And let me give various lines of, uh, of commentary that perhaps uh, relate to that. So, so one comment is that, of course, if you do semi-classical gravity, there's some kind of coarse graining happening. Right? Semi-classical gravity, by definition, you know, it doesn't access the Planck scale, uh, doesn't access very short times, etc. So to me, it's a priori just a sh real surprise that you can say anything about uh, you know, I don't know, unitary page curves and stuff like that, just using semi-classical gravity, because, you know, of course you need to know something about the microstates, right? That's what makes the system unitary, right? It just, uh, it's not, it's just not true that a single saddle point, I mean, or, or a single geometry, if you like, you know, encapsulates all the microstates. It's just not true. The fact that the Euclidean path integral with the wormholes, coarse-grained, as you said, is producing something unitary means but there's some, you know, you know, funny things happen to analytic continuation, right? You can have, uh, you can have one, uh, uh, you know, singularity in the complex plane encapsulate lots of information about other singularities elsewhere in the complex plane, right? You know, you, you, this contour integral equals, you know, you, you flip it around, it equals the integral over the other, uh, other singularities. We know that happens in analytic continuation. Yeah. So personally, I think something like that is going on with the restoration of unitary. I don't know how, I, I don't know what technically that statement is, but I think something like that is going on. And that speaks to your second point, right? Because you said, well, maybe that is why you wind up with this ensemble description, because there's some kind of strange coarse graining that's happened, right? And that coarse graining is manifesting itself in an appearance as if you need to sum up with this ensemble. Yes, I think that's perfectly possible. We, in fact, that would be nice. It would reconcile for us the idea that there are microstates is unitary, but that it's still true that if you do this Euclidean path integral, on the one hand, the analytic properties of the path integral allow you to recover this aspect of unitarity, which is the page curve, but don't allow you to recover that aspect of unitarity, which is you know, identifying a unitary rule. That's possible, right? So I think that is exactly the kind of thing that uh, uh, would make everything consistent and uh, certainly would make me happy. Let me give you also one piece of uh, evidence about the point that you just said. Right? You, you suggested, you know, I don't know, time course training, maybe like an ensemble course training. So you know how um, some years ago now, uh, there was the papers, there were various papers about the uh, dip ramp plateau uh, in the SYK. You know, uh, you do the SYK, you compute, I don't know, spectral form factors, you compute correlation functions in the SYK model, which is, of course, a kind of model of a black hole. And you see this initial dip that looks just like what you would get for a black hole, you know, the correlation function decays away, then you get this ramp, and then there's a plateau, right? At very, very late times, exponential times. Now, uh, the way in which those uh, results are obtained is by taking many realizations of the, of the, of the, uh, 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 of the SYK model, you know, averaging over couplings and all this kind of usual stuff, and you get this. Let me tell you another way in which you can get a thing like that, in which you do not average over couplings. So I'm going to refer here to a specific paper with Bartek Czech and Gabor Sharoshi um, uh, 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 from some uh, time ago, right? So uh, the way this goes is that uh, you take the, uh, a simpler system, right? You take the D1, D5 string at its orbifold point. It's even an integrable system. But you can show that if you take and the D1, D5 string at its orbifold point, you can look at the states. And uh, it was known from some time ago, again, uh, this is some paper with Per Krauss and Masaki Shigemori, um, that if you compute correlation functions in the states you construct at the orbifold point, well, okay, so first of all, there are many, many such states, enough states to produce microstates at the M equals zero BDZ black hole. If you compute correlation functions of graviton operators in them, you'll get the kind of BTZ correlator, and you, know, you can show all of that. But you can further show, and that was this point of this paper with Gabor and Bartek and company, you can further show that if you compute the correlation functions or the spectral form factor, you get a dip, and then you get a ramp, and then you get a plateau. 
However, because you're working with one microstate, a pure microstate, a single one, right? A very, very complex one, but, a, but one, you'll act, it won't be a straightforward ramp and plateau. It'll be sort of all jiggly. You know, there's the, there's the sporadicity. It's, it's sporadic because, you know, there's a specific state you're talking about. And it's a sporadic behavior that tells you what the state is. It's unitary, right? right? But then here's a way in which you can get exactly that kind of dip, ramp, plateau type behavior. Instead of averaging over couplings, which you can't, you know, you have the D1, D5 string in some particular regime here, you average over time, right? So in other words, that's supposed to be mimicking the kind of, you know, semi-classical observables can't do things that are too precise, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. So you average over time, and then that'll smooth these things out and make it go away. So in other words, time averaging um, can give you a similar effect as the ensemble averaging that you saw in the SYK model. So that speaks to your point, I think. And I think uh, I, uh, I, I agree. So I, th I think there's an interesting story here to be worked out about the relationship between these points. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, we will break now uh, and we'll come back for Prem's talk. And uh, could I suggest that we reconvene at 9.40 Indian Standard Times, which is uh, 36 minutes from now. Okay. And uh, there is a discussion session that is going to uh, continue. So don't go away. I mean, those of who, uh, you who want to continue discussing, please do that. Uh, and that will be coordinated by Shubho. So please go ahead.